Okay, let's start with some introductions. So I'm Ryan Bowen. I'm an engagement manager on the business intelligence uh, practice. And uh, I specialize in BI migrations. Uh, over the years, I've developed a lot of experience with, with legacy uh, BI tools, helping our clients here in Ironside, and as well as a lot of modern tools. Um, and it was only fitting after a while, uh, as clients became more and more interested in, in migrating the, their legacy platforms over to the modern tools that I kind of sit in, on both sides now and help that migration process. Um, so Bob, I'll throw it over, uh, pass it over to you. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, Bob O'Donnell with Ironside now for a little over seven years. Uh, prior to that, I was a solutions architect uh, with Cognos and IBM. So I have a fairly deep background in uh, business intelligence and analytics. And the last few years have been spent uh, working with QuickSight um, and the AWS platform, as well as working on a number of the components you're going to see here today, uh, as far as trying to move uh, Cognos and other tools uh, to QuickSight. So that's uh, what we'll be talking about today. And before we get into it, uh, I just want to give a, a, a quick overview of, of Ironside. Um, that you know, we've been in business for 25 years, helping leverage our clients, you know, our data for making you know business decisions and. Um, we have five different practice areas that we do this across. We, we, we serve um, the entire data lifecycle from data engineering, so integration ETL, all the way into reporting and analytics within the BI side of things. That's where Bob and I uh, sit. And then into advanced analytics and, and machine learning, and that, that's our data science uh, practice. Uh, we also have an advisory uh, services where we help you know, develop your, your data strategy. Um, and then we have a managed services team as well. Um, and over the years, obviously, uh, we've we've built up a lot of uh, and fortified a lot of great partnerships uh, across, you know, the tech spectrum and, and AWS has been an absolutely uh, fantastic partner of ours as, as QuickSites, um, you know, really, really become an, a, a prominent and, and, and popular tool in the market today. Um, we've been, you know, working side by side with them in developing this tool. And so we're pretty excited about where it's at and, and where it's headed. So let's get into the BI migration side of things. Um, you know, it, it absolutely can be a very daunting effort uh, and, and, and cause a ton of angst uh, across, you know, C-suite uh, as well as, um, you know, key stakeholders alike, right? And, and there's just so many unknowns and that's what drives that, that, that anxiety, right? So, so how, many, how many reports, you know, do we have? What needs to move um, and what doesn't? You know, that, that is a critical piece that we found, you know, you can reduce a lot of your effort by deciding, you know, this, none of this is actually being used and isn't providing any business value today. So why are we going to spend the time, uh, the effort, the cost and migrating that over? And, and, and there can be a sizable chunk that we found in environments that, that span, you know, decades old that, that have these, these types of assets that just aren't needed anymore. So that's a very important question to answer. Uh, what about functionality? You know, are my, loser, my users going to lose that? You know, these aren't these tools aren't exact exactly the same, of course, right? And so, you know, there may be some functionality differences, and so, you know, is that going to impact us meaningfully? And what can we do to, you know, have workarounds to where the users are still able to get the answers that they need? Um, and and how long would that take? How much will it cost? And, and who will actually, you know, do the work? Like th this is a short list of questions. There's there's an ongoing, you know, list that you know. It, key decision makers are going to need answers to. Um, and so that's that's why we're here today. You know, Ironside, that's that's what we've done for 25 years is 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 help clients move not just from, you know, legacy, you know, platforms if you're seeing on the left side here to, to QuickSight, but actually legacy to legacy, you know, legacy to, to modern and, and even just modern to modern modern tools. You know, we, we've had a lot of experience in the migration space, which has helped us, you know, build accelerators. Uh, and technology and all, all, all sorts of other other good stuff to to help that journey. But really, what we fortified and most importantly, and, and what we're most proud of is is really a methodology and and how you get from A to B uh, in, in, in as fast as possible, as as cost you know sensitive as possible um, to make sure that that um, you know there's good ROI there and that it's it's accessible and whole. So honestly, uh, you know, take this slide as as an agenda for the day. Um, you know, Bob and I are going to uh, walk through each of our three areas here, assess, mobilize, and, and migrate. Um, that assess portion is, is we're trying to answer all of those questions that you have, right? That initial slide where your anxieties comes from, uh, who, 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 who's asking you, you know, for these answers, 
this assess page is designed to get you all of the answers that you need so that you can make the decision whether it's to start mobilizing and migrating on this on, on this you know large bi migration um and so there's activities and, and deliverables associated with each of these pillars um and we're going to walk through each of these uh today so Paolo, i'll kick it over to you for the assess portion all right thanks ryan uh yeah as as you mentioned there's a lot of questions to be asked and answered uh, as part of this process um, the assess, assess phase is basically these three different uh, pillars or sections. Um, obviously, the first one is a BI content assessment. Um, what's out there? And, and a lot of companies we we talk with, you know, depending on how the uh, the environments were set up and how long uh, the tool has been used or multiple tools have been used, there could be an awful lot out there, and not all of it is, uh, you know, really pertinent anymore. But we don't know that. Um, so part of the process is to figure out just what's out there. Um, how complex is all of this stuff? Um, you know, this the, the chances are good that this was not built overnight. So it's taken a lot of time and effort and iterations to get these uh, reporting assets out there uh, to the point where they are now. Um, so we, we dig a little bit into that. And then how compatible are they with whatever the target tool might be? In this case, obviously, QuickSight. Um, so what are the differences? Are there, you know, there, we've, we'll see things that match up very, very nicely. Some things that need to be a little bit, uh, have a rework and other things that kind of need to be redesigned or reimagined. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so the second part would be a content rationalization um, based on what we just said. So a lot of the content out there, is it still being used? Um, is it still important? Um, is it being used by a lot of people? Is it being used by a handful of people? Um, so what can we get rid of uh, based on its usage or its compatibility um, and its future use uh, moving forward? Um, so hopefully if we can get rid of some of the content or not just, just not migrate it, we can uh, reduce our cost and effort. And then finally, the third part, uh, what is the overall lever, level of effort um, to move all of this information, um, all of these reports and dashboards that have been built out? And then uh, what, how does this make sense financially? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Ryan, next slide, please. So our process of the content assessment is basically going to try to pull as much detail information as we can get from the uh, the current legacy environment, and it's going to depend on the on the tools or tool or tools that are being used, um, depending on where the content is stored. So some tools have a content repository that we can access, and we can get the information on that, and some of it's more spread out uh, across either you know client and server um, or on the cloud. So the potential for getting that information might be different from tool to tool. Uh, the idea for our process is to get as much information as possible because uh, that's going to make it easier to determine uh, a what is you know how complex the system is b how compatible it will be with quicksight and c finally what the what the overall cost might be uh, to move all of this stuff so what we try to do is take that content and we score it based on complexity and compatibility uh, complexity is scored based on the uh, the source uh, not necessarily the target. So what we do is, based on our history and knowledge of that uh, that legacy tool, how hard was it to build some of this content? And that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have to build it the same way, but it gives us uh, input into how much might be out there. And we call these, and you see this referred to here as features. So how many features are out there that we need to consider and a feature could be a text box or a uh, a pie chart or a more complex cross tab with multiple uh, panels and things like that so that gives us an idea on the complexity of how much is really out there and then the compatibility side is another scoring that we do based on what our knowledge is of the target tool and obviously of quicksight as well so what we'll do here is, and it's usually a, a three or four different numbers that we'll attach to it. Um, compatibility for certain things, like we'll, what we'll find is on the detail is, if we have, uh, if you drop on a cross tab, there might be a number of different objects as part of that cross tab 
that are just there. So we're going to zero that out, but the cross tab will ha have a score. And from all of those scores, and you see some of the information here, so the minimum score, the max, what the median is, um, we can bucket these into low, medium, and high complexity compatibility. And from that, it gives us an idea of what the level of effort is going to be to migrate all of this. What we generally do, um, and for the first one there, you see usage, we we'll take the audit log information that we have access to and see what's being used and what's not. And for our first pass for uh, an estimate on what this might cost or the level of effort is basically just saying, okay, let's look at what was used in the last 13 months, let's say. And we will segregate that and say, okay, this is going to be the bucket we're going to go with, not really knowing what in there might not be valid to move or there might be duplicates and things like that. But it gives us a first pass at what that scoring is going to look like and what we may or may not want to, uh, to move over. All right, Ryan, next one. Thank you. So again, our, our Ascent IQ process is what, uh, what we've created, um, and that gives us the detail information into uh, what the uh, legacy environment has out there for us. Um, now, one of the things we do is when we, when we build out this process, uh, we take in all of the audit log information and the content that we have access to at, at the, whatever level of detail we have, and we try to figure out um, what is valid based on the usage and what would be good to migrate. So what we do is we give the client, the customer, all of the information that we can glean from all of this and let them create an in-scope list. Um, because there's certain things that we just can't tell based on the numbers and the value. So um, are training and samples uh, important that we need to keep? Are there some high profile reports out there that have may not have been run within the time frame that we got the audit logs, but they're still very important? Or is there any governmental or regulatory reporting uh, that we have as well? So the content rationalization is something that the customer actually does, and they're the ones that are going to create that in-scope list um, of the reports that we are going to look to migrate. Uh, we will then use that to kind of recalculate the uh, estimates and the ROI. So now that we've got it down to a more manageable subset, um, we can take a look at that and then get a better understanding of what the time frame is going to be and what the cost might be as well. And then from there, it's like take the legacy content and we can prune it or move it or rename it. Um, this, this process can be done by the client. It can be done by Ironside or as a, a, a joint effort. Um, knowing, though, that depending on the size and the age of the original legacy content, um, this may not be necessary. If you take, for example, if I've got a small uh, group of people that use a specific tool that I want to migrate to QuickSight, and it's fairly new, um, all of that content might just get moved over. So they might not need to do any uh, content rationalization or pruning. But for most of the uh, environments that we've seen, it is something that we would strongly recommend just to clean up the environment. And again, on the pruning side, if you're doing, if you're completely going to sunset the environment, uh, you may not have to go through the process of actually deleting all of it. Um, just moving it around might be good, so it makes it easier for the folks that are going to be migrating all of this stuff over. Next slide, please. And so finally, uh, what's the uh, migration estimate or the level of uh, effort? Um, and we take a lot of the information that we have uh, from these processes and take a look at some of these numbers. So what's the rationalization? Is it going to be 20% of what we had? Uh, is it going to be 50%? Is it going to be 80%? And then what's the complexity of all of these reports? And again, the complexity, although it's based on the legacy tool, it is helpful to know the amount of content out there. So um, it's going to be a little bit longer to, to create a, uh, a new version of a dashboard that has 10 sheets as opposed to just two. So just having those numbers. From, from that, we can go out and take a look at, you know, what's the total hours going to cost us for um, creating the data side of it or the reporting side of it, uh, obviously the testing, uh, setting up the environment, what are the, what are the resources going to look like that for that, and what's the, uh, the time frame for that as well. All right. Thanks, Bob. Um, <clears throat> so the last question, you know, in the, the assess phase, um, you know, why does migrating make sense financially? Uh, and so when we start to look at uh, an ROI analysis of this, 
Um, you know, let's start with this on the right side here. It's just a high level, uh, you know, arithmetic. What's our savings going to look like? What's our cost going to be from our legacy TCO to our future TCO? And and, and that's how we'd like to talk, uh, think about ROI analysis, right? And so when you're talking to legacy T T TCO, what what is the total cost of maintaining and operating my legacy systems and technologies today, right? And then on that right side, we're looking at what that, that future cost would be, right? Being being on QuickSight. Um, and so right above it, right, that box there, that delta, that's going to be our migration savings. Um, and so the way to get there is, let's start with our costs. So as Bob just walked through, you know, most of our first phase there, that, that assess phase, we have that that BI content assessment, that's, that's the first stage. Then it's our rationalization, and then there's this migration piece. Right. Each of those have costs associated with them. Each of them are my, part of that migration transition investment. Right. Initializing costs. And then there's going to be obviously a, an, an added cost of when you're actually on QuickSight. Right. There's it's not free. Right. There's going to be an operational cloud cost of being on there, even though if it's it's, it's a lot uh, cheaper than where you where you're coming from. Right. It's serverless. So there's just no, no hardware that we have to maintain security wise, et cetera. And then it's a subscription and in, in session based. So. So you can, you know, determine whether that you want to go subscription model, which is, you know, fully under your control. Sometimes when you have a lot of different, uh, many BI users, uh, they're coming from, you know, your old platform, you get nervous about, uh, you know, provisioning all of these licenses, uh, even though it's, it's, it, it, you scale it up, right? It's, it's not just a all in hefty upfront license, license cost, whether your users use it or not, which, which typically we see coming from uh, a legacy platform. Right, and you, and so your options are you can go subscription. We could also go session based, right? Which we found is, uh, you know, then very important in, in in realizing some of that uh, ROI because uh, it's a lot cheaper, right? We don't have to provision those licenses to those users. So there is those operational cloud costs that that, that we must consider when when we are moving from uh, our legacy to 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 QuickSight. Um, and so this is where we derive our costs, and now we must derive our our savings. So this is part of this ROI analysis phase that we haven't really discussed within the SS portion, but but it is part of it, right? So, and so Ironside, we'd, we'd work with your IT team to determine, you know, what infrastructure do you have today that can go away? What licensing structure do you have today? The support, the maintenance, uh, all of that, you know, the operational overhead that that's required for all of your legacy systems, that's part of your total uh, legacy TCL. And, and what, what, what can be removed, uh, you know, going forward into when we move to QuickSight? Um, and so, you know, Working working together with your IT team, we can come up with those inputs. And overall, right, that's that's where we get to our delta here. So um, going from legacy to future, we have our, our our costs estimated out for us. We work with you guys to get your say, you know, what your savings look like. Um, and and then there is this, you know, what we see typically is this decent chunk of migration savings. Um, so you know, many of our ROI analysis have found that you know, between 55 and 70% of savings can be found in total TCO after, after migrating to QuickSight, which is, you know, why a lot of us are here today, you know, why it's extremely popular um, for, for many businesses to migrate, migrate to the cloud. One thing we have not talked at all about, and we've been trying to figure out what's a good, where, where should I put this slide in? Because at some point we're going to talk about, need to talk about our data side. Um, you know, many, many cl clients, you know, many businesses today, you know, if they're thinking about migrating their, their their BI environment, they're probably thinking about or or maybe even already have uh, hopefully uh, migrated a lot of their data infrastructure side. But if you are not one of them, uh, you know, this this looming question here, should we move our data first? Uh, the answer from me and Bob, unless he, you know, he'll chimes in differently, we believe the answer is yes. You know, uh, it's going to save you a lot of rework time when it comes to this reporting. Um, but if you do move your data afterwards, which can cause some concerns related to, you know, creating no, some new connections, uh, repointing already those data sets that you've already built. And then there's this validation side that is a very real risk and that me and Bob have, have seen uh, working with clients that are sometimes even moving uh, and migrating in parallel, uh, our data and our, our BI assets. It's that, you know, they don't tie. All of a sudden there, there's some issues uh, related to our new ETL pipelines. Um, and all of a sudden validations held in question, all of a sudden our BI migration uh, um, has some concerns. Um, and so we do believe uh, that you should move your data first and it'll make it'll make uh, moving all of your, your BI assets, your data sets, your, your, um, your data sets within your BI tool and your reports uh, a lot easier. 
All right, Bob, mobilize. All right, thanks, Ryan. And just to reiterate on that point, um, and we we have seen it where if you're doing more than one thing at a time and you go to validate that, now I'm kind of guessing where the problem might be. Is it in the data or is it in the report? And it just, it just ex expands the amount of time it takes to kind of fix all of those things. So it is, if you can silo it, this is one of those rare cases where siloing is not necessarily a bad thing. So taking care of one and then the other is, is a great way to do that. Um, so for the middle section, um, just prioritization and optimization, um, get the stakeholders involved, make sure that everyone is on board with what's going on and what's going to be migrated and what the new environment will look like. Um, determine what the environments themselves, am I going to have a dev test and prod or is this going to be a, a dev and prod, however that's going to be designed. Um, what we are going to do with the rework and redesign strategies, so uh, potentially there's going to be things that won't come over the way they were before. Um, how is the best way to fix those or make them available to the end users um, so it fulfills the need that they had uh, all along? Um, and simple things like, you know, what are the headers and footers going to look like, images, themes, et cetera. Um, that may not have been part of the original legacy tool. It might have just been kind of grown organically. But when you get a chance to kind of stop and take a look at that um, and, and build that out ahead of time, that makes it uh, a much more uh, productive time when you're going to actually get into the migration phase. Um, are you going to do the bruning? Um, is it a, again, I mentioned before, is, is this a sunset or a shrink of the legacy environment? Um, if it's a shrink, uh, I would definitely recommend pruning because you're going to want to get rid of that content anyways because it's just going to simplify and, and um, make more usable the, the legacy, the smaller legacy footprint that's going to be out there. Um, and then start to look at, you know, how we're going to bucket these things for the migration. Uh, is it based on usage and complexity, a little bit of both? Uh, do we want to start off with some low-hanging fruit? Obviously, if we can get these things out there on an iterative basis and start to get the end users working with the tool, uh, it makes adoption a lot better. And essentially, from that, um, what's viable for a proof of concept? And then finally, you start to do the, your project and resource planning. So um, who's going to do this? When are we going to start it? What's the overall picture? Is it going to be you know one person working heads down for five years, or do we have a team of 500 and just going to plug it away you know very, very quickly? So those are things, obviously, to consider. Next slide. And we mentioned it. So um, we overall generally uh, would strongly recommend a proof of concept, um, even if it's just a small subset. Now, uh, and we're going to see a little bit more of this before, but depending on your uh, your structure as far as taking handling uh, projects, if you're doing something with an agile idea, um, a POC may not be necessary, but you can kind of fold it into that. Um, so it just gives you an idea to say, okay, we've got a subset, and maybe for a POC we take you know a handful of simple ones, a handful of, of middle complexity, and a handful of hard ones, and just to see how it shakes out. Um, our assumptions are made based on uh, compatibility. Um, are we finding that the way these things were actually used in the report was a little bit different than what we thought? Because at the end of the day, until you actually open up these reports and look at the detail of what's being migrated, you miss a lot of the nuance for some expressions that are being used, calculations, um, how the, uh, you know, the, the uh, visualizations may not have been used as intended, but they solve the problem. So how do we go about fixing all of those things? If you can find those things up front, um, it, it makes it uh, much more beneficial. Um, so again, we would uh, definitely recommend a proof of concept, either if it rolled into the project itself or a separate uh, chunk of that. Great, thanks, Bob. So now we've uh, mobilized uh, and planned this migration out. Uh, we've got the resources ready um, on, on both sides uh, to make sure this is done successfully. Now we'll actually start with, with migrating. And, and, and Bob said, you know, we're kind of shaking hands here between this POC and then into our, 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 our first, you know, uh, uh, first sprint, let, let's call it here, uh, when it comes to delivering um, some reports in the new, in the new uh, BI environment. So. So our delivery approach, I thought I'd start here, a little zoomed out view uh, of how what we found to be successful. Um, it's a little bit of a hybrid uh, approach between agile and, and, and waterfall. And um, and the reason we see it that way, and, and I'll just kind of go through pillar by pillar here, which is, you know, 
first off, you're, you're, we're, we're scoping what we believe we can finish for this um, for this chunk of time. This sprint could be a, you know a couple of weeks. Um, either way, you choose that chunk of time and to, to identify a scope in which you believe you can you can deliver those those reports. Um, and so there's obviously a development effort that follows, right? There's an automated approach, and then there's a manual effort. Those go hand in hand. And then once um, that report's ready for validation, there's a QA uh, and documentation portion of this. And once that's uh, validated and ready to be handed off and released, production go live. Uh, we'll do a demo uh, with the users, and um, and then for after that, right? There's there's a support and, and, and feedback mechanism. Um, and and just as Bob said, right? Like like. The goals here and why we found this to be successful is, you know, there's always, you know, something lurking early on that you may not have initially scoped out that, you know, said, OK, we need to we need to address this potential blocker and iterate moving forward. And so, you know, during these uh, this first 20 reports that we've you know finished off in sprint one and handed over, we've realized we need to do X, Y, Z uh, in, in order to, you know, uh, even have a more successful delivery in the next next sprint or so. And, and so this hybrid, which this agile turns into a waterfall after a while, because um, these are disjointed, right? It's not a natural software development lifecycle type of agile approach, right? These are uh, separate siloed pieces, right? The first report isn't going to be tied to the last report. And so just really the point is uh, this iteration process we found to be highly valuable um, as you start this migration approach. And then afterwards, you know, as I said, like because they're siloed pieces, you can feel feel comfortable moving into uh, a, a waterfall like approach. All right, so zooming in a little bit on the development process, you know, and, and what are these roles and responsibilities? So, so how we see it is this is Sentai Q engineer, this senior developer role, and then a junior developer role, each with their own swim lanes. Um, our Sentai Q engineer, right? Th this is the person that's that's tasked with the automation piece. Uh, um, they're creating the data sets for us and the dashboards to some percentage, right? Not not to completion, but you know, they're, they're, they will, they will uh, get us uh, some percentage to completion in which the senior developer and junior developer will take over. And, and so the senior here should have, uh, you know, a sort of ETL, uh, you know, C SQL, um, should, should have some sort of, you know, good data modeling, you know, good, good experience working with data sets to ensure that everything that's been automated, been created by our tooling, um, you know, checks all the boxes and, and is make sure everything is validated all set before they hand off that da data set, check it off before that dashboard can be handed handed over from the automation side, from the Sentai Q, you know, swim lane, all the way down to our junior developer to where then uh, the junior can feel more, you know, comfortable about, you know, completing that dashboard and validating that dashboard before allowing for a senior to review um, and then take, take you know, you know, uh, you know, keep track of any sort of takeaways from that, you know, learning experience through through the main the, the the dashboard creation process, and so that again that goes into our iteration uh, of our sprints uh, before passing it off to QA. So, um, you know, we see it this way where it's you know it's automation on, on top. We have our senior that's working worried about data sets and, and then the validation at the end, and then our juniors are are, are focused on you know being our data viz uh, experts. They're the ones that are going to be finishing off these dashboards. Um, and so that's how we, we kind of see our development process work. So I wanted to just highlight this just just at a at a at a higher level. Um, when we talk about automated conversion, I know a lot of people are really excited about all the tools out there, and and, and they are they are really great. Um, but us technologists, you know, there, we we there is a fault, you know, in in how we communicate that uh, to a certain extent because there isn't a, you know a, a, a an easy button out there. Uh, we, there's no way that you know our our legacy tools, et cetera, our, our differences between our, our BI tools, that they're going one for one because they're not the same tool, one for one over in a migration. There's always going to be some manual effort. And so I think that's important to highlight because uh, you're you're going to get, you know, sideswiped, be, be shocked to hear like, oh, it's going to cost us, you know, X, Y, and Z more uh, to migrate because of the fact that we can't just press an easy button and, and, and automate everything over. Believe me, it will never be successful if you think it think of it that way. And so it's best to, as we've tried to outline in our approach, that it's a methodology, not not a technology that will get you where you need to be, and that those work hand in hand, and not siloed, you know, uh, as siloed approaches. And so that's kind of how we view it, and we believe that's 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 what's required in order to get to a, a successful BI migration. So these la these last couple phases, I think, you know, they work together to build trust. 
from our end users. And ultimately, if we're going to have a successful migration, right, we, we need to drive adoption to these new reports. Um, and so the QA UAT portion, right, they're, they're focused on documentation and, and that data validation, making sure that our, our queries, our data sets are, are, are running correctly, that performance optimization piece. And uh, then use UX design, uh, making sure that our end users, you know, are going to be happy with the requirements met of this new migrated uh, report. Um, and so that that that's phase one. Next is, you know, we're walking through getting in front of users and and demoing these these batch of reports. Um, and it's not going to be three hundred that we show them, right? Let, let let's make it manageable. Let's get them excited about, you know, a, you know, a handful of these reports that, um, you know, we can just showcase. The exciting uh, new cutting edge pieces. What 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 are the, all the benefits you're going to get by uh, you know uh, with, with these new reports and this new tool? Like I I look at it when I'm with my my customers as as a selling effort. You know like get the buy in here. I think getting in front of them is super important um, and telling them why there's differences, but they're better differences. Um, and the, 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 of course, the Q and A is incredibly important in order to understand, you know, meet them where they are, uh, see how they see, you know, what this new tool could be, what what their concerns might be, and, and uh, honestly, it's a lot of just, you know, making like calming them down, right? You know, they're, they're, like they they aren't sure, they just don't know what they don't know, uh, and we just got to make them feel comfortable during these production releases, and then it's, it's post production support, right? Um, Generally, friction in the in the tech space become is just because people don't really know what that new tool is, that new technology. They don't want to necessarily open up that new report because they aren't re really sure how to how to work that new technology. And so, ensuring that there's literacy uh, out there, training uh, for our users is important. Uh, making sure we're listening, right, embracing that user feedback, I've found to be incredibly important in generating that buy-in. And then they may say all the all the nice things. But they may not be using those new reports that we migrated, right? So, but if we check the audit log data, right, we can monitor that usage and see if there's actually if they're adopting these new reports or they're not, and, and scheduling some time to talk with them to make sure that they are. Uh, and again, going back to answering sort of any questions, any concerns, uh, kind of addressing all that friction. So, to me, like these three pillars are just so important because they involve the user in so many ways, and, and that's the only way in which. We're going to feel like we have a, a really uh, good buy in, good, good successful migration. So I just, I just want to wrap up, you know, about these takeaways from today. I feel like we covered a lot, right? There's just, this could be, uh, you know, many, many webinars if we want to get in the nitty gritty of each of these the, these pieces to a BI migration. So, you know, we, we stayed at a high level. Uh, I feel like we still covered uh, a lot of good bases, but, you know, at the end of the day, this is what we feel like is important to take away, which is migrations, again, are about methodology. You know, use that technology to augment each of these methods, right? These assess, mobilize, and migrate um, migration steps. Uh, before before that, right, let's think about maybe moving our data first. It's going to save us a lot of headaches later on. Um, and so when, we're, when we do this assessment, we're answering all of those initial questions that, uh, you know, caused a lot of anxiety amongst our, our key decision you know makers um things that just don't know with with the the information they have today and leveraging you know our ascent iq our, our technology and our process right we can tell you all of these things about you know what's being used what's redundant duplicate duplicative right complexity compatibility answer all the questions that you need to know about what is going on in my bi environment today and how can i get elsewhere um so mobilizing Right, Bob talked about you know making sure you're meeting and getting that buy-in with your stakeholders, prioritizing and, and maybe even decommissioning some of those reports after you've had you know those discussions about what's in scope, what's out of scope. You can refine that scope and optimize you know how you we feel like we can uh, build those sprints and 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 deliver on time, um, and then migrate right. Combining once again technology and expertise, right? Those go hand in hand to ensure that you know our our development time is accelerated and and adoption. Uh, of these new BI assets uh, is 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 successful.